Welcome to Dealing With Life. I'm Tom Baker, really glad you stepped on the bus today. I pray that you are touched by today's show. If you're struggling or if you know somebody that's struggling, one message we want you to know today is you're not alone. If you are in a hopeless situation, through God, you can find hope. If you're afraid, through God, you can find strength. If you're hurting, through God, you can find healing. If you're lost in the darkness, through God, there is light and direction. Stuck in a pit, through God, there's purpose and meaning. All you have to do is just reach, trust, listen, and serve. Our God is a mighty God. Through Christ, there is forgiveness for anything in the past, and there is hope for the future. I'm Tom Baker, author of One Dog's Faith, and this show uh, offers you guests who have gone through difficult situations and found victory and also a deepened faith. And we also uh, offer you guests who have been called or have found themselves in the place of helping others who struggle. And that's what today is. With me uh, on the other side of the microphone is Bert Rosen. Uh, how you doing? I'm good, Tom. Thank you so much for giving the opportunity to come be with you today. I so much appreciate it. I'm really glad to have you. If you don't know, Bert is uh, what is the, the president? Are you CEO? What, what is the uh, what is the title? My official title: President and CEO at Knox Area Rescue Ministries. Uh, some know it as CARM. As CARM, correct. Yes, and um, uh, what a what a, an amazing organization, and 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 so many people you help. Uh, through throughout the year, could you? Uh, we'll start out. Could you tell us uh, the operation? What what is CARM? CARM is the place where anyone who is homeless can come and get the services they need to help get them back on their feet. In terms of what we do every day, we offer housing to anyone who needs it: men, women, and children. And that is approximately 400 to 500 people every single evening. Every day? Every day. Are you serious? And then for those who perhaps might be in want of a meal, some more hungry than others, but all looking for a meal, we serve about an average of 1,000 meals a day. Wow. It ebbs and flows a little bit, Tom. So in the hottest part of summer and the coldest part of winter, we see a spike upward in the number of people who spend the night with us. Sure. And then there's a correlating spike in the number of of meals that we serve each day as well. We don't stop there though. So CARM operates with this little equation that I say is easier to say than it is to do. <laughs> okay. And that's rescue plus relationships equals restoration. So what we do is we throw out a lifeline to anybody who's in need of that hope that you were talking mm -hmm. about. Anyone who is in need of getting a new vision for their life. But that lifeline that we throw out is to meet their most pressing immediate need. And for most, that is a meal and a place to stay for the night. But what we also find is that often that's the tip of the iceberg. It's and there's basic a, needs. Correct. But. And once we get those basic needs met, that's that rescue piece, then we begin to build relationships. And the idea is it's the same formula that God used to redeem us. He sent Jesus on a rescue mission to right. come save us so that through a relationship with Jesus, we might restore the relationship with our Heavenly Father. So for the people that are coming to us, it's rescue plus rebuild a relationship. And the idea is that if I can perhaps build a trusting relationship with you and you can trust me, then perhaps if you've never met our Father, I can introduce you. But if you have, I can help restore that trust. Right. And then what we're looking to do is to help those individuals discover that shalom, that peace that God talks about that allows a person to be redeemed to their community, to their loved ones, and, and to be neighbors again, uh, if you will. Now, in all of that, 
the reality is people who come to us, if they're able to work, they need to go back to work. Right. If they're able to pay their way through because they're capable of doing that, they need to begin to do that. So we offer an array of other programs that are all designed to help a person get back on their feet. Some can get there a little bit more quickly. But that's sort of the woven thread that goes through all of that. You know, and as I was listening to you do the, the introduction, you were talking about hope. You know, the Bible tells us that hope deferred makes the heart sick. And where there is no vision, people perish. It's, yeah, it just it, it becomes hopeless. It does. And so what we try and do is awaken hope in people and then give them an opportunity to have a new vision for their life and reverse this downward spiral that has begun to occur. And most of us in our personal lives, including me, have had those experiences where things seem hopeless. Absolutely. Whether we know God or we don't, we still have those dark moments where things look bleak, our faith is shaken. And when that happens, when hope is deferred long enough, the vision for something more begins to go away. So for us, it starts with a meal, it starts with the housing, it starts with meeting those basic needs. And then once we're able to understand a person's story and their journey, we can begin to direct them on a path that can help them get back on their feet. And sometimes that's CARM providing the services directly. Other times it's helping them get to a place that perhaps is better suited for their needs. It, it's so easy. And I've seen it, and, and, and I know you have too, where, where just the window shut and the world outside seems hopeless. And you, you say other people have hope because they're better than me or they're smarter than me, or they're richer than me, or they just, they, they've got it all together and I don't. And, and it, it's, it's a hard place to be in, and it's a hard thing to do to reach your hand out and say, please, somebody help me. It, it absolutely is hard, and most of us don't want to go there initially. No. It's only when we get to where the prodigal son got, where the slop that the pigs are eating finally begin to look good. <laughs> And it's almost yeah. as if I'd rather go anywhere than CARM because of what that means. It means I've failed yeah. if I've ended up at CARM. Right. It means I have no other resource, and I'm now at a spot where I can't lift myself up out of the muck and the mire. So CARM represents usually the last choice. It's not bottom. The, yeah, bottom. It, it's, it's not the first choice. And so as we pay attention, we talk about offering something called overwhelming biblical hospitality. Just because you're homeless, just whether you have been on the receiving end of something unfortunate or you've just made some decisions that have landed you where most would say you deserve to be there, yeah. that doesn't matter to us. Sure. What matters is that you've come to our door in search of something. And so this idea of I came for a drink of water and we can offer you something that'll quench your thirst a lot longer than the cup of water you're about to drink. Wow. I came looking for bread, but we can introduce you and offer you the bread of life. And, and often we remind ourselves inside the walls of CARM of something that Alistair Begg uh, shared with us a, a number of years ago. Uh, Pastor Begg airs on uh, Joy 62, I believe. It does, and I'm a big fan. Pastor of Parkside Church in uh, Chagrin Falls, Ohio, just outside of Cleveland. Okay. And he's from Scotland, which was the birthplace of rescue ministry work. Is that right? And when he talks to us about that, one of the things he said is, I hate to burst your bubble, but you don't have to be a Christian organization to provide someone a meal. He said the reality is anybody can do that. Certainly. You don't have to be a Christian in order to offer someone who needs a place to stay the same thing. Anybody can really do that. And then almost with a pointing finger of admonition, and we're very, very mindful of this, he said, if you want to be just another social service agency, go ahead. But I can assure you it will be the beginning of the end of what you do. Wow. And then with that sort of admonishing finger, <laughs> he says, but what you do that nobody else can do is you usher people into the very presence of Jesus. So at CARM, that's what we do. We're all ushers carrying our little usher flashlights, uh, so to speak, ushering people into his presence. And what we will tell people is that more than anything, 
we want you to know who Jesus is. We're going to usher you right into his presence. However, Jesus doesn't write the check to KUB. <laughs> he won't pay your rent. You're right. going to have to do that. So Absolutely. we usher you into his presence. But for us, um, if one can talk about effectiveness and what we pay attention to, yes, we celebrate when we get someone off the street who didn't have a home who's no longer homeless. Yes, we celebrate when we help someone get a job who so desperately needs to go back to work and provide for their family. And find self-worth, yeah. Correct. However, we will have failed in our mission if we have not given you the opportunity to respond to the message of hope that's found in Jesus. We can't make you accept it. That's not our job. Our job is to offer it. Our job is, let me introduce you to Tom. And then what happens between you and Tom is between you and Tom. But you will be richer because I've created that introduction. Right. We're introducing people to the one who can make an eternal difference for them. You have a beautiful chapel. Talk about what happens in there. Well, um, we have shifted our model a little bit. So one of the things that we're out to do is to make sure that every person who comes through our door has an opportunity to hear the message of hope. Okay. So each morning in that room, we have something called daybreak. Uh, and that's really at the light of day, as the name would suggest. And this is where people have an opportunity to gather, hear a few announcements for the day. Think of it as what used to happen in elementary school for a lot of us. You know, we, we went into class, we listened to the morning announcements, we stood for the Pledge of Allegiance. Sure. Well, we follow a very similar pattern, but woven within that is something inspirational for the morning. So different people come in and maybe just unpack uh, a passage of Scripture. It's not a Bible study. It's just intended to plant in the mind the seeds of hope for the day. So that happens in the morning. Okay. Then in the evenings, we also offer an evening service for those who want to attend. What really makes it different, though, is that oftentimes in the rescue ministry world, if you will, people still have the picture of individuals having to come and listen to the evening message before they go get to have their meal. Gotcha. Okay. We're taking care of the stomach first. Yeah, Let, because nobody's listening. Yeah, if, let's, let's if, fill if, your belly. Yeah, I like that. I like that. Now, the mind process is what the ear takes in, and God's Word does not return void. We're just kind of trying to set the table to, to make it a little bit easier for, for people to be able to hear that. And then one other thing we do in the chapel is— a couple of years ago, because of overcrowded conditions, we had to start sleeping people um, in the chapel. Right, right. And so over time, as one might expect, the carpets got soiled, and we finally got to a place where we needed to re remove the carpets and replace them. And then we decided not to replace the carpeting and not to replace the pews. Uh, aesthetically, it was beautiful. It was absolutely stunning and so worshipful. However, it was not helping us functionally for what we needed uh, to do there. Sure. Too hard to sleep people on pews. So we put in chairs like a lot of other churches had done, auditorium style, which allowed us to do a couple of things. One, if we do need to sleep people in there, we can stack the chairs, move everything to the side, and put mats down on the, on the ground. The second thing is we started something called the Arts on Broadway, taking advantage of our Broadway address. Yeah. And on this night... We treat people to the performing arts. It's not a gospel night, except that we're celebrating God's gift of music. And what we do is we set up round tables, battery-operated candles, a little light refreshments. And on this evening, we treat people to something that is not typical, the arts on Broadway. So the very first one we did was the Tim Hughes Quartet, an evening of light jazz, where they took the old Christian classics and put them to um, a jazz beat. And then we brought in uh, Maestro Brian Seleski in the Knoxville Opera. How awesome. And we exposed people to opera with this idea that God gave us this gift. Yes. We're exposing you to an alternative form of entertainment that's healthy and wholesome that perhaps you've never done before. Well, and, it, and it escapes the moment for a second to, to see the beauty. It does, and it enriches people's lives. So if we think about you and I as individuals, yes, we have to pay attention to our spiritual well-being. 
But there's the beauty of the arts, the beauty of what God has created that can be celebrated in the right way. So we bring all of that to bear on the folks that come to CARM. That's amazing. Totally amazing. And um, there's so much more to uncover what happens in, inside the walls there. But also, uh, we'll take a break, uh, but I also want to talk about your personal journey. And, okay. And why you are uh, where you are. Okay. This is Dealing With Life. I'm Tom Baker. We'll deal with more in just a minute. And I don't want the world to see me Cause I don't think that they'd understand When everything's made to be broken I just want you to know who I am I just want you to know who I am I'm no So glad to have you along. This is Dealing With Life. I'm Tom Baker, author of One Dog's Faith, a book about life, trust, and worry through the eyes of a dog. In the studio with me today is Bert Rosen, President and CEO of Knox Area Rescue Ministry. What you have shared with us so far is very uh, enlightening and powerful. Uh, but what I want to what I want to get to now is. Um, the perception. A lot of people on the outside see homeless shelters and uh, rescue ministries as just facilitating. And, uh, and I know that can be true, but I think you guys are, are really trying to skirt the edge. I noticed when you walked in today, there was a button that said uh, that you were wearing that said, prove Roger wrong. How does that connect? Well, um, it's it's a great question, and, and Tom, thanks thanks again for giving me the opportunity to be here today. It's a pleasure to meet you, and a pleasure to spend some time here uh, chatting with you this so afternoon. So glad you're here. Well, the perception on the street. Let me let me hit that pretty quickly. Uh, the perception for many is what they see when they drive down Broadway and they see the streets lined with people. The first misperception is all of the people that are on the street there are homeless. They're not. Many of them are there as purveyor of goods, and they're either uh, soliciting prostitution, or they're, um, th- they're the pimps who are doing it, or they're looking to buy and sell drugs. Those are not the folks that are coming inside crime. Right. That- but that's not true of everyone. So there are folks that are lining the streets who are mentally ill, who have severe sicknesses, who have what would be referred to as a dual diagnosis of having a substance abuse problem as well as a mental health problem. Okay. But the second perception is that CARM is just this place where everybody can get, like I used to be in prison ministry, and we referred to it as three hots in a cot. Um, <laughs> it's where people can come, get three meals a day, nothing's expected of them, and all you're doing is enabling them. Sure. That's where when folks are able to come inside and see a little bit of what we do, and I'm going to talk about that in just a moment, they have what they call the I had no idea experience. I had no idea that you were serving this many people. I had no ideas that your programs were as comprehensive as they are. I had no idea that women and women with children was the fastest growing segment of the homeless population. Okay, I had no idea. Now, Yeah, exactly. Now, back to the button. Uh, the perception that many people have, I would say at a point in time, was an accurate perception. Prove Roger Wrong is our effort not only to prove something different, and I'll come back to that in a second as well, but it's to shatter this idea that all a homeless shelter can do is provide meals uh, and shelter for the evening. There's so much more going on. Right. So Roger is Dr. Roger Noe. Uh, Roger is a retired professor at College of Social Work from the University of Tennessee. Okay has been doing a biannual study on homelessness for over 30 years. It's an outcome-based study, and every two years he goes out into the community with a team, and they're interviewing people that are homeless. The research typically reveals that a person's going to be homeless three times before they end their homeless condition. So the idea is if if you're a musician, a rock musician, the one-hit wonder, um, one and done is not so good. Not a great success. No. But if you're homeless, one and done is not too bad at all. Uh, yeah. 
there's this idea, we've, we've heard the axioms, if you always do what you always did, you'll always get what you always got. <laughs> De- definition of insanity, doing the same thing over and over again, right. expecting a different outcome. Right. So we had this intuitive sense, uh, as well as an informed sense, that we needed to do something different. My wife had given me a little book called Our Iceberg is Melting. It was written by John Cotter out of Harvard, and he wrote the book to identify eight essential ingredients necessary for organizational change. But he distilled a melting iceberg down to anything that threatens the livelihood of the enterprise or represents a significantly missed opportunity. Huh. We began asking, are we possibly missing opportunities to have a deeper impact? Right, instead of just feeding and, and housing. Correct. And so that book led to the uh, origination of our Launch Point program, which helps people get on the path to move forward in their lives with what we believe is a God-breathed plan between them and the Lord. But we also began looking for a little bit more, and we began to cut, connect a couple of dots. First, we, we go back to um, Old Testament Mosaic Law where we read that landowners were told not to harvest the corners of their field, to leave that for the poor. Okay. That's why Ruth was out doing what Ruth was doing and how she met Boaz. Right. Then we fast forward over to Isaiah 58, where the, the Israelites are having a conversation with God, and they're saying, God, we don't get it. We fast, we pray, we go to church, we go to Starbucks, we go to Cracker Barrel, we write our checks, <laughs> yeah. and you're not hearing our prayers, and God said, that's right, you don't get it. You're not getting it. I want you to clothe the naked. I want you to feed the hungry. I want to want you to loose the chains of injustice in people. So get we, involved. Get involved. Yes. Exactly. So we've been asking ourselves. So what do we do? What what's going to be different? A couple of quick hit points here. Uh, first, we, we took a cue from Dr. William Maltby, a British evangelist who died in 1949, but who penned this little monograph called "The Meaning of the Cross." And what he said is, "To bear sins means to go where the sinner is." to love a shameful being and therefore to be pierced by their shame, to devote oneself to their recovery and follow them with ceaseless ministry, knowing they cannot be recovered without their consent, and their consent may be indefinitely withheld. We asked ourselves, what does it really mean to be pierced by someone's shame? How do you really follow someone with ceaseless ministry, knowing their consent may not be coming any time right. soon? Which is the point where people usually back off. Correct. Now we go a little bit further, and along comes Tim Keller in his book, Ministries of Mercy, The Call of the Jericho Road. He said that helping the poor is a euphemism for destroying them, unless your effort has the intent to see them become all that God created them to be. Bob Lupton, in his book, Toxic Charity, uh, suggests that one-way giving ultimately diminishes the dignity of the recipient. And that if you give to a person once, you get appreciation. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Give to a person twice, it becomes anticipation. You coming back again? Three times expectation. I expect you'll be coming back mm-hmm. again. You're going to do this tomorrow, right? Right. Four times entitlement. You owe this to me. And then five times dependency. And we began asking ourselves, is it possible that in our good intentions— we could be fostering this a little bit. Fast forward, all of this is churning. Um, I, Carolyn and I have a son who disappeared uh, about 14 years ago. And so as a homeless parent, we're thinking, what do we do different? Sure. Then you look at what Isaiah says. Then you look at those pieces that I was just talking about. So with all of this churning around, Um, I decided to take my wife, Carolyn, on an anniversary trip to Berea, Kentucky. I used to live in Louisville and had been there many times. And so let's go to Berea College. We'll go to the Boone Tavern. I'll introduce you to Spoon Bread, and uh, (laughs) we'll have a pleasant evening. Well, that's when I saw the real story of Berea College, that students with high academic promise and little or no ability to pay could get a college education by working 15 to 20 hours a week in a college-owned business as part of their learning, labor, and service right. model. Right. And I thought, why can't we do that for the people that we serve? We serve Get people. Get them involved. Yes. People created in God's image 
who have great promise, and how does this help us take advantage of one of Lupton's other principles, and that is people benefit most when they have an opportunity to participate in the very systems that were designed to help them. To help them. And what emerged out of that was the Berea program, which we're now getting ready the 1st of August to begin rolling out in full fashion. So you're doing it. We, we are doing it. But part of those other pieces preceded all of this. So, for example, our Abundant Life Kitchen, which is our food service training program that teaches the Serve Safe course, which is the National Restaurant Association industry standard. We teach the course. We administer the certificates. And those who go through it work in our kitchen, helping learn and prepare to serve meals to the people that are coming through the line they used to be in. Okay. Our Clean Start program, building maintenance and janitorial in connection with Kelsan, who's the largest provider of building maintenance and janitorial supplies in the Southeast. Right. How do we begin to train and prepare and equip people for work? And then you have our Launch Point program, which basically suggests that God's got a plan for all of us, and you can have a plan for your life that fits within that plan. So what happens is on the outside, what people see is on the streets, and then they come inside. And they say, my goodness, I didn't realize you had all of this going on to help people. To, to help people build. move forward. Exactly. John 10.10, 10, I have come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. So we want people to experience the abundant life, not just because of what happens when you die and spend eternity with God, but right here, right now, you can enjoy the abundance of what God has for you And it's not predicated on how much money you earn on all those other things. It's predicated on experiencing his grace and his mercy in your life. And if you can do that, you can begin to experience the peace that passes, an understanding that's not dictated to by your circumstances, even though we all have circumstances and we all have our ups and downs. And that's when people say, I had no idea. I thought you were just meals and shelter. I can now see you are preparing and equipping people for a life that goes well beyond car. Wow, incredible. And people mistakenly think abundance as money. Correct. And it is life experience. Absolutely. How incredible. Bert Rosen, President, CEO of Knox Area Rescue Ministries. This is Dealing With Life. I'm Tom Baker, and we will deal with more in just a moment. This is Dealing With Life. I'm Tom Baker, author of One Dog's Faith. In the studio with me, Bert Rosen, President, CEO of Knox Area Rescue Ministry. Uh, How long have you been there? 14 years. My word. And and it's just grown astronomically. And as you pointed out in the last segment, uh, the programs and the attitude of real change and real uh, direction for the people who walk through your doors. Uh, it's so impressive, so impressive. What I would like to touch on is your journey. How, how I mean, I, I talk about people who are called to help others, but that's not necessarily your story. No, no, it's not. And um, uh, so let me just back up for a little bit. Uh, born and raised in Miami, Florida. Okay was introduced to the woman who is now my wife on a blind date when we were 16 years old. Wow. Uh, Carolyn and I have been together ever since. Uh, We have four grown children, and we are just delighted to call Knoxville home and love what we do serving at CARM. But that was not always the case. We were not excited about calling Knoxville home, and we were not excited (laughs) about coming to do the work at CARM. So, you know, it's kind of like, how does a nice Jewish kid from Miami, Florida, end up in Knoxville, Tennessee— uh, running a homeless shelter, okay. a, a Christian homeless shelter, uh, no less. Somehow the dots connect. Well, we, we, we hope they do anyway, because God's got a sense of humor, and, and he's got a plan. Yeah. And so, uh, b- born and raised in Miami, and ran a halfway house in Miami, Florida, for about 10 years. When I left Miami, uh, I joined Prison Fellowship Ministries, which is the organization founded by Chuck Colson. Yes. And spent 17 years with them. That took us from Miami, Florida to Louisville, Kentucky, to Washington, D.C., to Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. My goodness. And it was in the last year and a half or two 
during what would be 17 years at Prison Fellowship that I began to get this little rumbling in the gut that says change is in the wind. Don't know what it is, just know it's coming. And with that, the humble prayer back then is, God, we're sensing change, but we don't know what it is, so help us to see. Right. Because I don't see so clearly. I don't hear so perfectly, and I don't read handwriting on walls all that great. wisdom, and I need direction. Correct. And so God has a way of working through the circumstances of life, and that's what he did uh, in, in our life. And while I didn't know it at the time, Tom, I later found the parallel in the ninth chapter of the book of Numbers. Okay. It talks about the Hebrews following a cloud by day and a fire by night. Yes. And it didn't matter how long the cloud stayed. When the cloud stayed, they stayed. When the cloud moved, they moved. All in obedience to the Lord's command. Would I give a lot to have a cloud in front of me like that? <laughs> yes. So, God, don't know what's going on, but we want to be obedient to you. Yes. Three things happened that were pretty significant. The first was that uh, Carolyn was diagnosed with cancer. And when we found that she was diagnosed with cancer, all that's a part of that began to creep in. Oh my gosh, Carolyn's going to lose her life. I'm going to be a single dad, all of that stuff. Scary. And God miraculously worked in her life to a point where uh, she was cancer free. Wow. But in all of that, God opened up our eyes to what happens when cancer hits your home. This is not your neighbor. This is not someone else. This is your house, your wife, your family. Yeah. And as we came through that, it was, okay, God, you brought us through this for some reason. Should I leave Prison Fellowship and go to the American Cancer Society or some other organization? But that was not to be the case. Yeah, because you saw, you saw the destruction. You saw the, the, how it can really hurt. Exactly. Fast forward. Uh, Carolyn's a diabetic. She passed out at the wheel on the Pennsylvania Turnpike. By God's grace, she didn't hit anybody, but she also failed to negotiate the curve at one of the exits, which launched her airborne um, over the oncoming Mack trucks. They had to cut her out of the car, oh, no. life flight her to the hospital, and that's when we thought we were going to lose her. Now, we joke about it now. If you want to try out for the Dukes of Hazard, there's easier ways to do that. <laughs> and she was became like the bionic woman because they had to rebuild her with titanium okay. in order for things to work. But that meant going from the emergency room to the trauma unit to the rehab hospital to total bed confinement for what we thought may have been a life different than the life she now lives. Right. And in all of that, God opened up our eyes to what happens when you're either handicapped or facing that indefinitely. People park in parking spaces they shouldn't be parked in. The malls are not set up for that. The grocery stores are not set up for right. that. And so now we were sensitized to a different style of life than what we had. Our bedrooms are upstairs. And so now it's, okay, God, you've brought us through this. You had a vision. Yeah. yeah. You, you were able to see that world. Correct. Is it Johnny and friends? Is it something else? What do we go do now that you've brought us through this? We thought it may have been the cancer that would lead us in another direction. We thought it might have been that, but that was not to be it either. I mentioned we have four children, two boys, two girls. Mm -hmm. uh, Matthew, Matthew, the oldest of our four children, had the most academic promise. He was the most, as, most athletically inclined. And Matthew started out at the University of Miami, and then when Hurricane Andrew hit, he stayed to help with the cleanup, and then he left, went to Virginia Tech. And to make a long story shorter, uh, Matthew ended up dropping out of Virginia Tech, came home, but the son who came home wasn't the son who went away. Even though we visited on a regular basis, he would have been diagnosed as bipolar, but he didn't want to stay on the medication. And ultimately, Matthew ended up leaving home and ended up homeless on the streets. Oh, my. Matthew would come home, and we would have a few more occasions where we would uh, see Matthew, but ultimately Matthew disappeared. That was over 14 years ago, and we've never seen or heard from him since. Oh, that's got to be difficult. It's very difficult. However, God has a way of taking things and using them in ways you never would have expected. Blessings out of destruction. So yeah. Matthew had been gone for a year, and I loved what I did at Prison Fellowship Ministries. Carm calls saying, would you be interested in this position? The answer was a flat-out no. You're right. Uh, it's not on the radar screen. Knoxville, nice place to visit, but I don't think I want to live there. <laughs> and oh, by the way, even though you don't know this, I have a son. Carolyn and I have a son that disappeared 
about a year ago, I don't think I could go work for the homeless. And then he asked this one question, would you pray about it? And I said, oh, crud, what'd you have to ask me that Wait question? Wait a minute, that's not fair. Yeah, because if, if I don't have to pray about what God would have me do, I'm off the hook. <laughs> yes, there's but, no conviction. Yes. But if you ask, expect him to he will, answer. He, he will answer. Lo and behold, Carm called and asked if I'd be interested in coming up for an interview. And I said, yeah, okay, because I really didn't expect anything to come of it. Well, three interviews later, they offered me the position. Carol and I moved up here with no possessions, rented an apartment, and now I'm inside CARM. I'm the new CEO of an organization that's been around since 1960, and I can't look in the eyes of anyone who's coming through the door. And I thought, my God, what have I done? I've moved Carolyn away from our kids. They were all adult kids, and they, they had lives of their own. But they still were in that area. Correct. Um, so now we're living in Knoxville. Never been here before. Nice place to visit, but I don't want to live here. If I'm going somewhere by choice, I'm going back to South Beach where I grew up. Okay. And I don't have the stomach to work with the homeless. I can't do this. How do I tell the car board they made a mistake? And how do I go back and see if I can get my job back at Prison Fellowship? Oh, that's tough. I did not want to be here doing this. So then I could only do this one thing, Tom. God, help me to see with your eyes. Help me to hear with your ears and help me to feel with your heart whatever it is I'm supposed to get because I don't get it. I don't want to be here. I don't know why I'm here. And as I walked and as Carolyn and I walked, it was almost as if I did hear this little still small voice inside that said, Bert, I created you and I put gifts, skills, and abilities inside of you that you have nothing to do with. <laughs> I've also allowed you to be around some people that have allowed you to hone some of those things that I placed in you. And I need what you have at CARM, but in order for you to do it, I needed you to have a broken heart. Mm. You cannot do this work unless your heart is broken. And Rich Stearns, who is the CEO of World Vision, tells the story in one of his books how he inscribed in his Bible, God, let my heart be broken by the things that break your heart. Oh, that's tough. Yeah, it's a tough one. And so now you just go back to Isaiah 58, and Isaiah 58, 10 talks about spending yourself on behalf of the poor. And Tom, I got curious and did a little keyword search because I wanted to see how many other verses talked about that. I couldn't find any. Almost 40 verses using the word spend in the NIV, and they all talk about God spending time or spending wrath yeah, or spending him, anger. Yeah, of it. Right. That was the only verse that I could see. And if you spend yourself on behalf of the poor, you will, your light will rise and shine like the noonday sun. You will be a restorer of broken walls. And it was almost as if I said, okay, I got it. I now understand, God, how you're going to take everything that has been a part of Carolyn's life, everything that is a part of my life. Well, we don't know if we'll ever see Matthew again. We hope that we do. But there are 400 to 500 Matthews walking through the doors of CARM every single day yes. who have lost hope, who have lost vision, who need to be ushered into the very presence of God. And for whatever reason, for this season, he used the experience that Carolyn and I had with the son who ended up homeless to do something that we never would have wanted to do, never felt called to do, but God somehow is the weaver of things. Yes. And he wove all of that for such a time as this to have us here in Knoxville. And, and gave you the passion and gave you the heart. God's not interested in us being broken, at least for long. Right. And, and once you find your way out of that brokenness, yeah, the heart for helping others. I'm so glad that, that he did choose you for this because so many things are great things are happening there. Well, there, there is a lot of good things happening, and when folks say, how's it going to CARM? I say, I got good news, and I got bad news. Yeah. The good news is God is still on the throne, and by His grace, we're still there on the corner of Broadway and Magnolia doing what He's called us to do. Yeah. The bad news is people are hurting more than ever. The scourge of drugs is as bad as it's ever been at that I can recall, and so more and more people are coming to us feeling hopeless, feeling abandoned, 
adult parents that are sitting next to you in church who have an adult child that they don't know what to do with, who's not conducting themselves in a way that they should be. And the parents have exhausted every resource, no more insurance, no more savings, no nothing. And the last vestige is maybe CARM maybe you can, help. can do something. Yeah. And so we are that place on the little corner of, on the corner of Broadway and Magnolia, as I said, when all hope is gone, where all vision is gone, we're the place that doesn't say no. Simply incredible. This is dealing with life, and, and that is life at Ground Zero. Bert Rosen is with us with Knox Area Rescue Ministry. We'll deal with more in just a moment. Oh, ain't nothing going to steal my Joy. No matter what may come, I know you will let go. You're listening to Dealing with Life. I'm Tom Baker, author of One Dog's Faith, a book about life, faith, and worry through the eyes of a dog, available through Amazon.com, available through Cokesbury.com, Barnes & Noble, and uh, even right here at Cedar Springs Bookstore and Long's Drug Store. Bert Rosen has been with us uh, talking about Knox Area Rescue Ministry, CARM, uh, and such a powerful story you have and such a powerful thing uh, CARM is doing. Uh, thank you for being here. What I want to talk about uh, real quickly is how can people help? Well, there, there's three ways people can help. They can pray. They can shop. They can do. Okay. Um, prayer is what moves the mountains. It does. It unlocks God's power in people's lives. And there's two ways to pray. One is to pray right where you are. The other is to be a part of our every bed, every day prayer effort. And as it might suggest, the goal is to have every bed at CARM prayed for every single day. Wow. It's James 5.16 meets duck, duck, goose, meets prayer walking. <laughs> James 5.16, the earnest prayer of a righteous man has great power and brings wonderful results. And so students, Bible study groups, vacation Bible schools, they make little prayer cards about the size of a bookmark, handmade, and they're just notes of encouragement. And so we have volunteers who will come and drop them on the bed. So every person who spends the night with us, when they come up to bed for the night, they have one of those little notes of encouragement. Somebody's praying for them. Absolutely. And some volunteers may not have time to make the cards, but they can come in duck, duck, goose fashion. we got a lot of beds at CARM. Duck, duck, goose, God bless whoever's going to be spending the night in this bed. And they go mm. from bed to bed, sort of prayer walking, duck, duck, goose style, yeah. praying over every bed. Um, the give uh, and the shop. Uh, we have 18 thrift stores throughout the community. 100% of the proceeds from the stores go to fund the work of CARM every day. We're not government-funded, and we're not United Way-funded. So everything that it takes for us to do what we do every day in our two facilities, CARM and Serenity, we rely on the generosity of this community sure. to do that. Shopping at the stores and donating to the stores is one way of doing that. We do it often. And, uh, and Well, thank you. Yeah. Uh, and, of course, another way is for, for people to give. And so they can go online to give, karm.org, or they can write a check, and we're always grateful to receive that. And then they can do. You know, checks pay the bills, and they allow us to hire the staff and do the things we need to do. But... Remember our tagline from the first segment, rescue plus relationships equals restoration. And so really our other vision, if you will, is to be that place in Knoxville where God's people can use their gift, skills, and abilities to make a difference in the lives of the poor and the needy. And Tom, what people are starved for, even hungrier than they are for a meal, is a listening ear, a little bit of compassion, Someone who will spend a few minutes just listening, inviting and investing in a relationship. And so we need people who are willing to do. Folks who are willing to come down, down to CARM, help serve a meal, help get the beds ready, help do those things that it takes for us to do what we do yeah. every day. So they can pray in the way I expressed. They can shop and donate to the stores, and they can do by getting involved. We do something called the CARM Encounter, second Tuesday evening of every month. It's one way, but it's not the only way. 
but we get economies of scale by doing it that way. So um, Tuesday evenings at second Tuesday, 5.45 p.m., and you're out of there by 7 p.m. 50,000-foot view of the organization, Mm -hmm. walking tour, an opportunity to peek behind the curtain, so to speak, and identify those areas that maybe capture your interest and your heart, and you can then say, I'd like to be involved like to in that this. part of, of what it is oh, we that's do. That's wonderful. And there's so many things that you need. So A- many, absolutely. There's the lots of opportunities for serve. Even if we had all the money we needed to hire all the staff we would ever need, we wouldn't do it. Sure. Because we would be robbing you, Tom, the opportunity. of the opportunity yes. to do that. Yes. I mean, you, you go into the uh, situation like that, and you think you're blessing others, and you walk away with a real blessing in your own heart. You, you absolutely do. Well, Scripture says it, it is. we are more blessed to give than we are to get, and yeah. we, we see that in action every day. That's and the stories we hear from individuals who talk about how God has moved in their life we hear it from those who have volunteered and those who have been on the receiving end, where they point time and time again of what happened when someone cared and someone took enough time to put that care uh, well, that's into action. The definition of hopelessness sometimes is just because nobody cares. Absolutely. Why am I even here if nobody cares? But if you yeah. see that, oh, how great. Bert Rosen. President and CEO of Knox Area Rescue Ministries, thank you so much for opening uh, our eyes to what what you do. And thank you, you, Tom. Do. Thank you, Tom. We're, we're, like you and so many others, we're just trying to be where God wants us to be, when He wants us to be there, doing what He wants us to do. And that's hard to do sometimes. Yeah, but it's an honor to be able to do it. Well, and thank you. We're so glad you are doing it. Thank you. This is Dealing With Life. I'm Tom Baker. We do this every single week at this time. I pray that you are able to look beyond the fog and the smoke to see God's glory.